And throughout my life in public service, I've been guided by the tenets of Catholic social doctrine that cuts across all confessional faiths. What you do to the least among us, you do unto me. We have an obligation to one another. We cannot serve ourselves at the expense of others. We have a responsibility to future generations. That was President-elect Joe Biden earlier this year speaking to a virtual crowd at an annual Catholic charity dinner in New York City. His emphasis on faith appears to have partially fueled his 2020 campaign. CBS News early exit polls show Mr. Biden won 24 percent of white evangelical voters to President Trump's 76 percent. Now that is a swing of 12 percentage points for Democrats compared to Hillary Clinton four years ago. The president-elect also won a majority of Catholic voters, 52 to 47 percent. Mr. Trump won those voters 50 to 46 percent in 2016. The Biden campaign says Pope Francis extended his congratulations to the president-elect today. The two discussed helping the poor and climate change. When he is sworn in, Mr. Biden will become the country's second Catholic president following John F. Kennedy. For more on the Biden campaign's religious outreach, I want to bring in Michael Ware. He's a senior advisor to the Not Our Faith Political Action Committee. He also worked with the Obama administration's faith-based initiatives and led religious outreach during the 2012 campaign. Welcome, Michael. It's good to see you again. Uh, in a New York Times op-ed, you argue that it was Mr. Biden's direct appeals to voters of faith that helped him win. You say he held to a, quote, stubborn insistence on not demonizing those who disagree with him. Michael, how do you think that helped him with religious voters? Well, President Trump's entire appeal to religious voters uh, relies on this assumption of democratic antagonism towards them. And Joe Biden just wasn't willing to, to play that role. Uh, Joe Biden made a direct appeals inviting people of faith, including uh, Christians to his campaign, and it really undermined sort of uh, President Trump's sort of blunt approach to reaching out to these voters. And it, it served Biden well, as as you pointed out, Elaine. That that 12 point swing among white evangelicals accounts for about a five million vote swing. Uh, that critical bellwether vote of, of Catholics, Biden being able to flip that almost on its head. Trump won uh, Catholics in 2016 by four points. Biden, as you showed, just won by five. Those were absolutely critical, especially when you're talking about those Great Lakes states uh, where Biden really pinned uh, the, the, the hopes of his campaign uh, there, and, and he was vindicated. So let's dig in a little bit more. Our exit poll data show Mr. Biden's success with white evangelicals varied by state. So in Michigan, he won 29 percent of that group. But in southern states like Texas, North Carolina and Georgia, he got around half of that. So help us understand, Michael, those state to state differences with white evangelical voters. Is that clear at this point? Yeah. So. One, evangelicalism in the South is generally just more conservative than it is in the Rust Belt or in the Midwest. So that's that's number one. Number two, um, I, I think it's clear from my experience, from looking at uh, social science research, you know, race does play a does play a, a significant role in that difference. But then the third thing I'd point out is that even when you see those lower numbers in the South, take Georgia for instance, uh, 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 Hillary Clinton won only 5% of white evangelicals in Georgia. And white evangelicals in Georgia account for over 30% of the electorate. Joe Biden nearly tripled Hillary Clinton's numbers among white evangelicals in the state, which uh, made up for his margin of victory uh, that we think we'll see there. So it, it's it's a complex picture. There's no one single answer, um, uh, but the combination of the politics and the theology sometimes being more conservative in the South, the role that race played in this election, and, and then just the, the mechanics of the campaign. The Biden campaign was very focused on reaching religious voters across the country, but especially uh, their operation was pretty significant in those in those Great Lakes states. So was that born out of the one of the hard lessons learned from 2016 is do not neglect voters of faith? 
Absolutely. And I'm I'm so glad. And I expected that Joe Biden would would learn that lesson. But, you know, we, we've discussed it was a was a major oversight uh, in, in 2016. In 2020, Joe Biden just said that, that, that that's not going to happen with me, in part because of who Joe Biden is. He testified throughout the campaign of the role that his Catholic upbringing, uh, what he's seen as someone who's been a public leader in this country uh, for so many decades, the, the role he's seen faith played in our communities, the role that he's seen faith uh, play in helping this country get through some of its toughest times, um, uh, it, that influenced his campaign to a great deal. I, I should also say he, he had a great campaign infrastructure. He had staff that understood the importance of faith, uh, and, and that helped him out a great deal as well. So it's interesting when you look at the dynamics here, the gains that the president-elect made with white evangelical voters are similar to the inroads, some might say, that President Trump made with black and Latino voters. Yet we know the president ultimately lost those groups by significant margins. But I wonder if you think that Mr. Biden has the ability to grow these voters of faith into a stronger voting bloc for Democrats. He does. And, you know, it's one thing to not be antagonistic during a campaign uh, where, you know, ideally you're asking for the votes of all Americans. It's another thing to prove that you're not antagonistic through governing. And so that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be serious policy disagreements. But I would expect and hope that a, a Biden administration will navigate those policy disagreements, particularly with religious voters when they come up with uh, some care, with some deafness, with some consideration um, that, frankly, would be in line with so much of Joe Biden's political career up to this point. And if he does that, if he can prove that through governing, uh, the kind of Trumpian appeals that conservative Christians need to be afraid of uh, of Democrats, that Democrats don't care about them. If he could prove through governing that that's not the uh, that that isn't the case, um, th then I think that this is something that he could build on with evangelicals. With uh, I think it's it's important to say. Uh, 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 people of color who are people of faith. I, I don't think we should be looking at um, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of voting breakdown among different racial constituencies separate from faith. It, it's all part of a whole. And, and then with, with Catholics as well. You know, um, before the election, I had a chance to talk to some voters who uh, were voters of faith who were looking at Joe Biden and considering voting for him, but said the thing that gave them pause was abortion. And so I wonder, uh, you mentioned policy, right? What is it that you would expect to see, given what you just spelled out about the fact that he has, in fact, pitched himself as the president of all Americans? Uh, obviously, there are going to be policy differences. But on that specific issue, uh, Michael, what do you think we will likely see in, say, the first 100 days from a Biden administration on that? Well, look, there, there's going to be a desire from some on the left to not just make policy decisions on this issue, but to use this issue to, um, to gain what they think will be an upper hand in the culture war, to sort of take it to conservatives like they think Trump was using this issue against progressives. And uh, I, I would uh, just, uh, I would hope that the Biden administration would show some caution. When you're, when you're president, you have to make decisions on issues. And I would expect Biden is going to make decisions that fall in line with his career, which is he upholds Roe. But when it comes to things like the Mexico City policy, there are little things you could do, such as not changing the Mexico City policy, which uh, just uh, it, it affects um, how uh, taxpayer dollars can go to organizations that support abortion um, in overseas uh, funding for for NGOs, for non-governmental organizations. Um, you, you could change that policy not on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, January 22nd, uh, that, that could be seen as a, a message of dominance or antagonism. But, but just wait, wait a couple days. Um, there's going to be a fight over the Hyde Amendment. And Biden's going, the Biden administration is ha going to have to think about whether, um, whether they're going to fight to um, repeal the Hyde Amendment, which refers to taxpayer uh, funding for abortion domestically, 
or or if they're not going to spend capital there and instead spend capital in getting health care uh, to more people and in passing uh, significant domestic spending bills that will help all Americans. These are the kinds of conflicts that will come up. Again, there are this is a divisive issue for a reason. There are no totally satisfactory answers. The most important thing is that the Biden administration and Joe Biden himself uh, 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 proceeds here uh, not in a way that's meant to stoke conflict or, or as Biden has said himself, raise, raise the temperature, but that they seek to lower the temperature. Um, and again, Joe Biden's navigated this issue for decades. Uh, he's prided himself as being middle of the road on this issue uh, and someone who, who is sensitive to the moral concerns that pro-life Americans have. And as long as he shows that concern, that nuance, I think he'll have enough capital to, to not just help him politically, but help our country to heal. All right, Michael Ware. Michael, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Great being with you.